So, uh, yes, I'm talking here about uh, the textile techniques, but just the woven items. That means things that have been made with a loom. Uh, other techniques, basketry, matting, twining, and so on, will be mentioned here and by Susanna. Uh, just, hmm? no, where is it? Yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, um, doesn't work like I wanted. Um, just that. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, th this just shows the problem what we have because, of course, textiles are quite rare in the archaeological record and they need specific conditions and you all know of them. Uh, and the most important of them that are um, what we are focusing on in the third and second millennium BC are, of course, the uh, textiles that have been found um, due to um, um, ice, that means Earthsea the Iceman, we have some examples here of reproductions, also metal corrosion when it comes to yeah, Copper Age and uh, Bronze Age, and salt because the salt mine Hallstatt, they are the earliest from the mid-second millennium BC, and of course the uh, um, bog, uh, the, the uh, lakeside uh, finds uh, from the lakeside dwellings around the Alps. Uh, which are really a wonderful source that help us a lot in understanding how textile techniques in general can look like. Of course, in some of the cultures, as for the corded ware, but also some of the bell beakers also have impressions of textiles. But as we have heard in the um, presentations before, usually the textiles, the design seen on the uh, pottery is not direct imprint of textiles, but inspired by textiles. That is what we are talking about. Here just a small glimpse on the chain operatoire of how to make a woven item. This is simplified. Um, you also find this graph here on this board if you want to go into the deep, because we, I don't want to uh, um, talk here about the preparation, spinning techniques and so on. I'm all, only sticking on the weaving and patterning techniques of, of course, woven items. No? Uh, for the spinning, yeah, certain tools are used and also the spinning reflects a lot on what is the, the output there uh, at least. But the most important are the weaving techniques that can happen with a lot of different things. We can show here only the uh, small band weaves because the big warp weighted loom we could not bring in here, but you might imagine how it worked. Um, the, when it starts uh, with weaving with a loom, we just have very basic, simple structures. In, and we have that until the end of the Neolithic. For example, here this textile from Brodek, um, it's actual a find from a bell beaker site. It's a tabby woven item, but it's the same technique that's still used today and also was used for most 95% of Neolithic and Bronze Age textiles as we know so far. It's really the basic principles. And items um, that could have been used for weaving such bands, could have been, for example, uh, with those crescent-shaped loom weights. We also have this band uh, weaving implement here, and someone who wants to try out can try out. This is uh, based on finds from Melk Spielberg. But we, of course, we also have um, evidences for warp weighted looms, that means bigger machines to make actual textiles. And um, I think it was Franz, who excavated this loom here from Krems Hundsteig, it's in, in his own place. Some years ago, he excavated that. Um, and it's one of the earliest um, really in situ layers of loom weights where we really see uh, here the standing of the horses and here the loom weights in between, really an evidence for such a loom. Uh, what we also have is um, indirect evidence for weaving on a warp weighted loom and that are the starting borders because you integrally need them to weave. Um, we have them from Neolithic sites as well as from um, yeah, Bronze Age sites. And 
the technology uh, behind textiles, basketry, twining, weaving is sometimes very long living. We don't have such a fine chronology. Uh, we have more the bigger lines of what happens. Uh, also the finishing borders. Uh, here we have some from uh, Stone Age and Bronze Age. And I showed this, for example, because also the finishing borders are giving structures. It, if it's fringes or things woven in or structures like, yeah, those zigzag things that appear if you do certain things, but it's also something that was there in the material culture and maybe inspired the people uh, as a tech, uh, as a um, design principle, uh, even to use then for pottery. As you see here, all of those structure design. It just appears when you're weaving here um, in the um, lower row, you have the combination between the starting border and then the, yeah, the basic web. This is Bronze Age, this is Hallstatt. Um, <clears throat> yeah, what we have here on, to see it on a, on a bigger principle, we can summarize what's going on uh, because um, here you have listed the weave types that we have. Uh, that means also the structure types that we have and the patterning techniques. And I will come to this graph later on again. And I also plotted it there if you want to look at it in detail. But you see that Neolithic and Bronze Age textiles are very simple. Tabby is the main weave type. But there happens something, but it's in the mid-second millennium because then we get the switch from a very easy um, one shaft loom to a multiple shaft loom. And also this machine enables to make twill. That means this zigzag structure, for example. Of course, you can also do the same by plating. But to have this structure, even 3000 years before we actually have twill weaving, doesn't mean that we have twill weaving in, in this case, Middle Neolithic. That means it's a technical difference and the same applies to the tablet weaving. If you have, if you do something by hand and Dorothea can show it to you, because you can play it whatever, you can change whatever. But if you put it on a machine, that means on a loom where you cannot change, where you have to program your threads, how to behave and so on, this is a really important technical step. And this was somewhere at the beginning or mid second millennium. Uh, yeah, the same applies to the tablets. Uh, it's the same different uh, difficulty because, okay, we have this Portugal and Spain uh, tablets, but we even have the same things uh, in Lengel culture here in Central Europe. And they have it in masses in Moravia. They have, I don't know, hundreds of, but we are quite sure that they are not weaving tablets. They are lids for those cubic things, okay? Of course, you can weave if you try, but you can also spin if you put an apple on a stick, then you also can spin. It doesn't mean that this was a spindle, okay? It's just to make it bold. Uh, the first real tablet woven item that we actually have is this one, and it dates to the mid-second millennium BC. Um, we have a lot of other techniques and uh, a lot of items that are from the lakeside dwellings, and there is no tablet woven item at all around them. So uh, coming to the patterning techniques that are really important because they also give some interesting designs. And what we have in the late Neolithic are those floating weft principles. Um, the Molina di Ledro band is really, it shows those uh, lozenges and, and things like that, but it's not made uh, um, as a program in weaving as twill woven. It is made inserted by hand. Uh, Kaylee reproduced one uh, of those and uh, she will show you um, the end product there. It's just on what you insert uh, during weaving. Of course you can do that, but those things are really singular. We have one of that, one of that, and a lot of plain tabby woven items that have no pattern at all. What we also have is needlework in different kinds, embroidery soon on beads and seeds like those here, late Neolithic, and 
elaborated needlework. This is from Pfeffikon Irgenhausen around 1600 BC. We also plotted it there with the uh, um, detailed C14 date. This is really also singular. One, yeah, crazy item of one crazy person that ate too much mushrooms. I don't know what happened there. Okay, sorry. <laughs> but this is really, we don't have anything comparable to that. No, nowhere. Um, what we also have is uh, a thing that is called spin pattern. You can twist a thread in two directions. You can twist it in Z or in S direction, okay? It's how you spin, how you turn your spindle. And if you use the threads um, in groups, then you also can make very interesting structures, even stripes or checks or whatever. And it's just uh, yeah, how the light is reflected by in this or in the other direction, twisted threads. It's quite interesting. This is something that also appears in the mid-second millennium BC and is really, really common in the Hallstatt period. What we also have is uh, from the beginning of the Bronze Age, um, color patterns, stripes. And here from Franz Hausen, there was uh, a textile found in this um, funny bow and it's really the oldest striped textile that we have in Central Europe. I'm always talking about Central Europe, just to make it clear. Uh, yes, the, the colors of the textiles are usually the normal colors of the, yeah, of the material, including the sheep. But even um, when they started to breed white sheep, as we have it in the mid second uh, million MBC, then they started also to apply dyes on the textiles, meaning uh, here, for example, the blue dyed textile from Hallstatt mid second millennium BC. And they also added other dyes and then it got more and more and more. Um, and this applies especially to um, uh, wool, to wool, because wool can be dyed much e more easy than um, bust fibers uh, such as flax. But you could paint on textiles. Our problem is that we don't have any painted textiles so far. Yeah. Um, how it goes on, and this is how it ends. Of course, we have a lot of creative things in the late Neolithic and in the early Bronze Age, Middle Bronze Age, and then some yeah beginnings of trying out creative zones of how, what to do with the material. But then when it shifts to the early Iron Age, this happens. And this is a complete oops, different type of textile culture. Uh, yes, but this is not our task today. I'm so sorry. Uh, what we plotted in there is that we see uh, a shift from a very creative basketry, twining, matting, whatever technologies, we plotted it there in the Neolithic to a more yeah, woven production-based thing of in the Bronze Age and then this exploding creativity in the Iron Age. This is the, the main global shift that we can recognize so far. Uh, for the twining, matting and so on, you will see it there. And now I give my thing over to the wonderful Susanna. <laughs> 